Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March 15th uh, meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. It's strange to have it be seven o'clock and still light outside. Uh, so that's sort of cool. Uh, welcome to Daylight Savings, and I think some of us are still um, trying to find ourselves after losing an hour on Saturday night. Tonight's main focus is uh, for the public to comment on the three proposals that are in front of us this evening, the collections, collections preservation for historic Northampton, bathroom ventilation at Forbes Library, and continued emergency repairs at the Smith Charities Building downtown. So we have three, only three projects before us on uh, this round, uh, as opposed to lots of projects in the first round in the you know, last fall. Uh, before we begin, we always start the meetings with um, general public comment. If there's anybody out there who would like to speak to things having to do with the CPC that do not involve these three proposals in front of us, the Historic Northampton Forums or Smith, now is your chance to have your say about that. So if you'll raise your hand, uh, Betsy. So you need to unmute yourself, Betsy. Yes, I'm Betsy Stone. I am the um, have the honor of being the president of Historic Northampton, and I've been on the board for eight years now. Before that, I was a volunteer, working primarily. So, uh, excuse me you? for interrupting one sec. Are Are you speaking, Betsy, on about the Historic Northampton proposal? Yes. Is that okay. the is so that just, appropriate? If you could hold off on that for one moment. Oh, okay. Um, this is where we're not speaking on proposals right now. We're just speaking in terms of general CPC stuff. Oh, so I'm okay. sorry I'm to interrupt sorry to, you. No, no, that's okay. That. But we'll, we'll have you. Um, Claudia, something about the general CPC functioning? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So thanks for having me. Um, first of all, I just want to say, you know, I'm part of a group that's thinking of applying for CPC money. And so I went to the website and I looked at the application. And the first thing it said is you have to fill out the form saying your intention to apply and that you should go to Appendix E. And I went, but there is no Appendix E. So I was stymied in my first effort. I wrote to Sarah today to tell her that there was a glitch here. But just to say, it's like, we want to seems make things as easy as possible for people. And if so it can't get past, you know, point A, it's problematic. Um, my, my next point has to do with, um, of course, as everybody knows, I'm very concerned about the historic aspects of my neighborhood Montview. And we've been trying to figure out how to, uh, to utilize whatever funds are out there and whatever groups are out there to help us think about how to go forward in the neighborhood. And so as I'm reading all the guidelines about CPC and what it's supposed to do and so forth, there's a lot in there. Of course, everything has to do with historic, what is historic and be, being designated historic. And I think we've talked about this with Martha and so forth. Is it just the, is it the famous architects? Is it the most famous houses, the most fancy places in town that are of historic importance? And I'm wondering as I'm reading all this, if you all have considered designating neighborhoods as historic of historic significance so that a particular house in a neighborhood or a building in a neighborhood wouldn't be historic, but altogether thinking of what is the neighborhood, could it be considered historic? Because part of what we're doing and you know is trying to figure out you know what is the history of this neighborhood and what is worth preserving, what's uh, worth saving going forward and that will involve trying to save parts of it houses or property or whatever and could as a neighborhood we think of how to apply um, using the cpc money to do that so that's one of my questions um then my second point and i also went to historic commission about this has to do with the barrett plan which is going to look at you know how to bring the historic business in 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 uh, into sync with sustainable Northampton. 
And I went to the historic commission meeting and I talked about my problems with the Barrett group. And I sent even a, a long letter to them, especially about the survey that they did, which was completely, I think, inadequate. And, and about their outreach and how I feel like they haven't done an adequate uh, job of outreaching to get people's opinions. It's been very, very limited. And then I see, because I've been looking at your website today, that you, that CPC funded the Barrett study in part. And I'm wondering if you have anything then to say about the outcome of this study or whether, or whether it's, it, if they're living up to their, to their contract to gather the information they set out to gather. Because I feel like it's going to influence the planning going forward, and it's going to then influence the whole city, including my neighborhood. And it would be great if there was some way to know that there was oversight to this, that there was some measure of accountability for the, the work that these people are doing. So those are my points. That's my points. And thank you. And that's it. I'm listening in now. Thank you, Claudia. Any other folks with comments um, like Claudia's that have to do with general CPC stuff rather than specific projects. Okay. Um, we have no minutes to approve. Is that correct, Sarah? Uh, correct. I'll have a few sets at the next meeting for you. A few sets at the next meeting. Great. And I have no, uh, no chairs report. Um, so again, the main purpose of this evening is to hear uh, from you folks uh, regarding your feelings about the three projects uh, in front of us. So our job as CPC members uh, is to listen, to not respond, but just to listen to what, what you have to say. Um, once everyone's had their chance to speak, we will then see as a committee whether or not we will begin funding recommendations tonight or whether we will put that off to the next meeting in two weeks. So it sort of depends for us on how many public comments there are, whether we proceed with funding recommendations um, uh, in this meeting, or we delay that for two meetings from now. I'm sorry, one meeting and two weeks from now. Um, so uh, uh, let's go right into the public comment stuff. The best way to do it for those of you that are unfamiliar with the process is to go down on your screen and you'll see the little uh, uh, reactions uh, icon. And if you click on that, a little hand can come up so you can wave your hand and then uh, be put in line to speak. That's easiest for us to be able to see you to call on you. So if you can put your hands up and then we will um, get, to, get to all of you. Uh, and again, our um, job is not to respond to your comments at this point, but just to listen to what you have to say. So uh, again, three projects before us, Historic Northampton, Forbes Library, and Smith Charities. And we won't go in any order of projects. We'll just go in order of who's quick and getting their, getting their hands up. Um, so I think, Betsy, we'll start with you because I so rudely interrupted you at the start. <laughs> Um, I so rudely the, um, began without no, 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 no. without knowing oh. when. Um, anyway, as I said, Betsy Stone, I'm um, president of Historic Northampton's Board of Trustees right now, and I've been on the board for eight years. I love this organization. I feel like we're really going places, in part thanks to the CPC for some of the grants that you've given us. Um, I think we are doing some things that are putting us on the map. A recent barn project um, got noticed in, in Boston and people were coming out from the Eastern part of the state. So I think that we have uh, a hidden gem um, and that is our um, clothing and accessories collection. I know we're asking for $128,000 for collections preservation for the clothing and accessories, also fabrics and also furniture. But I'd like to focus on the clothing because that's the collection I know best since I've volunteered with Kiki Smith, uh, who's here and um, pre a previous um, director. Um, and I began to learn what we have 
put my hands on many of the objects very carefully. Um, we have an extensive collection of clothing, men's, women's, children's, focusing on the say mid 19th century, um, but going earlier and later. Um, and it's, it's a significant collection in this state, um, certainly in this region. And I would think if we can um, preserve it, uh, house it appropriately, it could be uh, a collection of, of, of that would draw people even nationally as some of our other aspects of our museum do. Um, it is wonderful for anyone who loves clothing and who can imagine the stories that go with the clothing to, to see these objects. Unfortunately, it's not wonderful to see how they're sort of crowded, I would say crammed into the small rooms of the upstairs of the Damon house. They need breathing room. Fabric needs air and needs to be protected from light and dust. And we have great preservation conservation people who will be coming in um, with thanks to this grant um, who would be coming in and um, helping us take care of or continue taking care of this collection and help us plan for its preservation in the future. I'm, I'm anxious and would be excited to see it um, able to be seen uh, at the very least, um, uh, documented photographically as we've documented other things and able to be seen on our website. But if it could be seen in person, I think it would be wonderful. Anyway, um, I think that's what I have to say. Um, and uh, appreciate everything you do and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, Mimi? Sorry about that. Get in the habit of keeping my camera off and off off for, you know, safety reasons. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Um, so um, my name is Mimi Odgers, and I live on Glendale Road in Ward 6, and I am the current Northampton elector under the Oliver Smith Well. I'm here tonight to voice my support for the Community Preservation Grant funding for the Smith Charities Building. As many of you may already know, the Smith Charities was founded in 1845 from the will of Oliver Smith. The role of this charity has been an incredible resource to the city of Northampton in many ways. One way was the establishment of the Smith Vocational High School, which is one of our city's gems and a school that provides incredible opportunities for our younger residents, as well as other residents and surrounding communities. Additionally, the charity also provides financial gifts to tradespeople, as well as new brides and widows with children. In preparation for tonight, I did a little research and learned that the Smith Charities Building, I did not know this, so please forgive me, but <laughs> was designed by William F. Pratt, who was a prolific architect of downtown Northampton, um, who designed City Hall and other commercial buildings. I'm sure that all of you know that, but I learned that today. So what's a Reddit thing? Today I learned. Um, so uh, in my research, I found a thesis by Cynthia Hunt, class of 1977 from Smith College. Um, yay, Smith, I'm a Smithy myself. Um, and the following was included, so she did a thesis on William F. Pratt, and the following was included regarding the Smith Charities Building. Uh, it said, the unique function of the building is reflected in Pratt's design. The structure is set apart from its environment through many devices. The small building is sited on a large plot, leaving enough room for a lawn to encircle its perimeter. The green buffer zone separates the structure both visually and conceptually from its more commercial neighbors, divorcing the charities from the ordinary hustle and bustle of Main Street. The foundation headquarters is separated from the street itself by a fence, which lends the building a quiet residential accent. The Smith Charities is Pratt's most classic building. The author then goes into specific details on classical aspects of the building and includes the following. The entire effect is one of serenity, primarily suggested by the repeated rhythms and measured proportions of the Renaissance forms. The, this effect is enhanced by the homogeneity of the structure. All elements of the building are cut from Portland granite. This quiet and elegant stone was taken from the same quarry in Portland, Connecticut that supplied the sto same stone for a number of landmark buildings in Chicago, Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., New Haven, and Hartford, Connecticut. In fact, the quarry itself was listed as a National Historic Landmark and was also placed on the National Register of Historic Places. 
The building had an immediate effect on the town. Within the next few years, several downtown businesses either remodeled or rebuilt their establishments, generally using Portland granite in the, some form in the facade. I share this today because the building continues to serve as the headquarters of this very important charity, and the historic purpose and mindfulness that went into its development is emblematic of the charity's continued purpose. Our beautiful Smith Charities building needs help, and I respectfully request your support for our CPC grant application. I do thank you for your time tonight and for your volunteer service and volunteer service in support of Northampton's community preservation. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, as Mika, they could do what Mimi did, which is uh, to introduce yourself as well as your address. That would be helpful. Uh, Donna. Yes, uh, um, just give me one second. I'm getting the video. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Donna Festinger, and I'm an Oliver Smith elector. Many years ago, I was also a beneficiary of the widow's benefit from Smith Charities. I'd like to speak in favor of Smith Charities application that is before you today. Smith Charities makes a real difference in people's lives, and it was a huge help to me in my life after my husband died and I had a three-year-old to take care of and would wonder each winter where I would find the money to pay for the heating oil. And then I would get the support from Smith Charities and it got me through the winter, many winters. I'd like to read you a short letter Smith Charities received just last week from a recent beneficiary who has also been helped by Smith Charities. Just give me one second. My name is Angela Thompson Ellison. I wanted to say how beneficial the Smith Charities organization has been to me and my family over the years. What an awesome organization this is. I attended Smith Vocational Agricultural High School and graduated with a trade in culinary arts. I learned many things during my time there. First and foremost, a very strong worth work ethic, which I utilize every day and throughout my career and lifetime. I was fortunate to benefit from Smith Charities organization after I graduated. They offered a money monetary bonus for staying in your trade for a certain amount of time after graduation. This was a great help financially at that time in my young life. Years later, when I got married, I received a bride benefit also which again was a nice bonus with helping to start my married life and with starting a family. Many years later, and after the untimely death of my husband, I found myself a single parent to my young daughter, similar to my circumstance. Uh, finances throughout the years were always a struggle. Again, Smith Charities found me and offered a monetary benefit every year for widows with children. What a blessing that was. Every penny surely helped. I'm very thankful that Smith Charities was there for me for so many years. I hope that this organization will be able to continue to help others in need for a long time. Thank you, Angela Thompson Ellison. So she had very similar circumstances to me. Um, and it Smith Charities helped me out tremendously every year. Um, you get back to my place. So uh, we hope that you will be able to fund Smith Charities application so that the lovely historic building that houses this charity that helps so many people in our community can be preserved. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my comments. That's it. Brian, you're muted. Oh, okay. Oh, thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, Kiki. Uh, Kiki, you can unmute yourself, please. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. My name is Kiki Smith. I live on 27 Fort Street here in Northampton. Um, I am speaking again uh, about the wonders of uh, the historic clothing collection there at historic Northampton. Uh, I, <laughs> I wrote a very um, heartfelt uh, letter to you all 
first of all, from my time as a former um, head of the Board of Trustees, uh, when the CPC came through, sort of like the same stories I just heard about the Smith Charities, offering a chance for this these buildings to be literally pulled together. Um, and over the last number of years, that has continued, which does my heart good. Um, now it's the content of those buildings. And as I would like to impress, this is yet another gem. I've heard that word a few times tonight of a collection. It really is renowned even beyond the state for the range and the quality of some of the pieces in this um, sort of small but not tiny collection, which as Betsy said, is crammed into the second floor of the building of the Damon building. Um, it is a gem to someone like myself and to students I've had at Smith, uh, to students coming out of UMass, to high school students, to elementary school students, maybe not as many as the high school and the college level and graduates level, to do hands-on research with remarkable pieces. Um, clothes are uh, very personal things and they offer a tangible connection to real people who in this case lived here in our community. And remarkably, there are often pieces of letters and journals from those same people, which can only enrich our appreciation of our um, ancestors here in this community uh, and how they lived and what they felt was important about themselves. There was um, a little story that Nancy Rexford, who really pulled this together, um, wrote numbers of years ago about a bodice that she found from the 1830s. And she knew who it had belonged to. It had belonged to a local woman who had died, I believe, of consumption at a young age. Uh, and the bodice was um, unattached. It, there was no sign that uh, it had been altered for anybody else to use, which is unusual. But what Nancy began to deduce was, this is an era before or only at the time when daguerreotypes were beginning to happen. This was the only living piece of memory that her family had of her. And it was important to save the bodice that this woman had worn. So, um, I encourage you to uh, allow Historic Northampton to proceed to assure us that these garments are as well protected as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tihi. Amy? Hi, my name is Amy Kitmacher. I am an Ada Comstock scholar at Smith and currently doing work study at Historic Northampton. Uh, I don't have anything as eloquent to say, but I would like to speak in favor of the Historic uh, Northampton's preservation project. Um, as Kiki and Betsy have said, the collection is really quite wonderful. When I first started working there, I had the privilege of taking out an 18th century apron, a uh, hand embroidered apron and uh, was just absolutely thrilled to be able to handle this and and uh, photograph it for a researcher. And it, it this is a, a collection really worth taking the time to preserve and to document properly so that others have the privilege of working with it um, now and in the future and being able to access it online as well and as in person. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Rob? Yes, uh, hello, I'm, I'm Rob Weir. I'm a retired history professor from the University of Massachusetts. And um, I'm here to speak on behalf of the, the library project. 
uh, on the surface, it wouldn't seem like the ventilation of a bathroom would be such a big deal. But I have to say that with the exception of stop and shop, there's no place in Northampton in my 40 years in town I've spent more time than at the Forbes Library. I'm, I admire everything that they do. Uh, I am currently working with the, the Calvin Coolidge Museum. I've also spent a lot of time researching in the Hampshire Room. And when I can, I, I like to actually go to the Forbes and, and uh, do my writing there. The one thing that's not very enjoyable there, though, is the bathroom. And this is an important thing, the bathrooms, I should say, plural. Um, this is an important thing in the age of COVID and, and just public health in general. And I remind everybody that the Forbes is a public library. That is to say that we don't get to say who comes through the door and who doesn't. And at this point in our history, it's very important that we have good ventilation in the bathrooms. I can honestly say that sometimes it's not been very pleasant to have to use the bathrooms there. But more than my personal comfort, I think it's important that the public has uh, safe facilities all around. Uh, the Forbes is a welcoming place. And uh, I had again, admire everything that they do. So I want to speak in, on behalf of that project uh, to improve the ventilation. And I, I believe there have been some studies showing that the only way they, they can do that is to ventilate out, out the top of the building. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not possible to do much of any kind of uh, retrofitting inside what are basically hermetically sealed little rooms. Um, so I would like to uh, speak on behalf of that project and uh, again, I'd like to th thank, uh, I echo everybody else who has thanked the CPC for, for their efforts. And, uh, and thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of this this evening. Thank you, Rob. Maureen? Yeah, um, my name is Maureen Flannery. I'm a Northampton resident, live on Crescent Street, a friend of Forbes Library and a frequent user of library services. I'm here to talk about the Forbes Library request for CPA funding to improve ventilation in the seven restrooms in the library building. For 40 years before I moved to Northampton, I was a family physician in Eastern Kentucky, during which time I served on several county boards of health. I earned a master's in public health from the University of Kentucky in 2003. But I learned relatively little about ventilation during my years as a primary care and public health practitioner for me, as for many other healthcare workers, it was the COVID-19 pandemic which educated me about the importance of ventilation. What we have all learned from my experience during the pandemic is relevant for dealing with pathogens responsible for COVID as well as other infectious diseases, including chickenpox, measles, seasonal flu, and especially in public restrooms, norovirus. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, I found myself on two committees responsible for making decisions about the safety of gathering in the Northampton Friends Meeting House on Center Street. In March, 2020, we closed the meeting house and transitioned quickly to, public, to uh, virtual activities. During the 15 months that our meeting house was closed, we focused on preparing our spaces for reopening, which we did in July, 2021. As you may recall, our understanding of how COVID-19 spreads evolved over that period. From an initial concern about cleaning surfaces, remember when we were washing produce and quarantining mail and wiping everything down, we arrived at our present understanding that airborne spread is primary, making attention to indoor ventilation critical. So we improved the meeting house ventilation system, which had been installed in, 20, in 2004. Interestingly, at the time of its installation, there was a concern among members of the meeting about making the space accessible to individuals with chemical sensitivities. So the system was actually designed with attention to fresh air intake. In preparation for reopening, we upgraded our HVAC filters, added a quiet big ass ceiling fan and established guidelines which brought in outside air from the 10 large windows whenever the space was occupied. In contrast to the Friends Meeting House, Forbes Library's seven restrooms 
a small enclosed rooms, as Rob said, within a historic building, which have an old and inadequate ventilation system, last work done in 1998, with no windows and with no access to fresh air. Researchers are still trying to pin down exactly how best to ventilate indoor spaces to prevent COVID and other infections from spreading and what alternative technologies might replace or enhance mechanical ventilation systems. But enough is already known to start creating safer indoor spaces. And an engineer has proposed to do that for the seventh Forbes restroom by adding ductwork and venting to the attic. Retrofitting the ventilation system for the restrooms to deliver clean air at sufficient levels is possible, essential, and consistent with the historic nature of the building. The proposed plan should meet the standards issued last year by the federal government's Clean Air in Buildings Challenge. Funding has already been obtained to improve accessibility of the restrooms and addressing ventilation at the same time would be cost-effective and would minimize disruption to the library services. In a heavily used public building like Ford's Library, it's important to provide restroom facilities that meet current indoor air safety requirements for the benefit of library patrons, employees, people who use the library as a warming center during cold weather, and indeed everyone who spends time inside the historic building that is Forbes Library. So thank you for your attention and for all you do for um, the Northampton community. Thank you, Maureen. Devin? Thank you, Brian. Um, I had a chance to speak to you at your last meeting, so I'll make this very brief. But in the meantime, I have realized that uh, the health department at the city of Northampton level has uh, identified a ventilation committee that is working on these issues in our public buildings. And they also put together a video that I sent Sarah the link to. And those are things I didn't even know at the last meeting. So I wanted to give a shout out to our uh, Department of Health and Human Services and the work that the health department is doing in town on making um, everyone aware of the air quality issues that we need to be thinking about. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Uh, Carol? Yes, hi. Um, so I, uh, you've already heard from me before, so I'm not gonna give any substantive comment. Just wanted to, uh, yeah, Carol Gray uh, with Smith Charities. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I sent some support letters. Uh, uh, Lauren wished she could be here, but she's got a two-year-old that she's putting to bed right at the same time. And um, another woman wanted to be here, but her health is not great, but they both sent letters. So uh, so hopefully you got those. And uh, just wanted to say I'm available if you have any questions. And um, thank you for your past support and uh, for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Any other folks out there who would like to speak to one of these three proposals? Now is your chance. Anybody, anybody? We are good to go. Okay. Uh, Sarah, can you review for us, uh, just a reminder, um, for fo for community folks, but also for the committee members, the finances, what what we have available to us, what the costs of each of the proposals are. Sure. Let me just share the financial snapshot for the remainder of the fiscal year. So, talk us through. That would be great. Yeah. So, uh, the, this sheet shows the estimated the local revenue that came in, uh, as well as the state match, plus expenses and projects that were recommended for funding for the first round. So that leaves the um, CPC with approximately six hundred and thirty-five dollars, six hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars available for spending for the remainder of fiscal year twenty-three. Um, 
projects that have requested CPA funds, this round total $429,118. A uh, question for Sarah from committee members about the budget. So just to reiterate, we have four, was it 429,000, I believe, Sarah? Correct, yep. In project proposals, we have 635,000 that we would be able to spend. Uh, committee members know and the public should know as well that any money we don't spend this round is carried over. We don't, it's not use it or lose it. It's carried over into the next round, which would be the fall of this year. And then additional money would be coming in on top of that as well. Uh, so committee members, we uh, once again, any financial questions for Sarah? No? Okay. Uh, so we have a, in the past, we found it very useful to do our deliberations in one in one evening rather than uh, talk about it and talk about it and then delay voting uh, to um, for the next meeting because a lot of us uh, can't remember meeting a meeting what the heck goes on. So uh, I think uh, it is a quarter, not even that, it's 20 of eight. Uh, are committee members good with doing our trying to get through our funding recommendations um, uh, this evening, see if we can push through that with only three proposals, it's a little bit easier. Uh, how does, uh, thumbs up from committee members, if we wanna to try to tackle that. I'm seeing all thumbs up, Jeff, is there a thumb there? Let's see, Jen, yes, Jana, thumb up, thumb down. Okay, good. So we'll try to, we'll try to, um, move through all three of these proposals at, at this time. Uh, um, Claudia, if you're still listening, I don't want you to think that your, your questions regarding the difficulty of accessing things, the Appendix E or the, um, the other two issues, the Barrett Group and the designating historic net, uh, neighborhoods um, is, is lost in this shuffle, but we will put those off for another uh, for probably two weeks from now or when, when we meet again, because I think it requires some okay. work. Thanks. On our, I, our I, you know, I won't let you forget about them. <laughs> Great. So that's Thanks. Kind of, that's Thank you. Good to know. Thanks. Uh, okay. So um, given the order that Sarah sent the, the um, agenda out, we have uh, discussed historic Northampton first, Forbes Library second, and Smith Charities uh, third, that's simply the order that 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 Sarah uh, Sarah lumped them out. Um, the way that we've done this in the past is to pretend that we have a shopping, and at the beginning, sort of make motions to. Uh, well, first, we discuss issues, and then make motions for for money, and put them into the shopping cart. And that doesn't mean we're going to actually check them out, but it just means that we are interested at that point, and then we see how it how it plays out. And then once we check out, we can revisit all of those things. So um, let's begin with uh, historic uh, Northampton. The proposal is 128,000 for the collections, um, preservation and inventory. Uh, do people want to speak about that? Martha, we miss you last meeting. It was, uh, uh, we're, we're wishing you a speedy recovery with your leg, but in, given that you are a historian and given that all three of those are historic in, in nature, we'll, we'll all be curious as to your take. So maybe you can start us off with the historic Northampton discussion. Sure, thank you. I'd be glad to. Um, the commission did meet with uh, the representatives from Historic Northampton and reviewed um, the same presentation that Kelsey uh, provided for this um, uh, group uh, two weeks ago. And um, I think that, well, a couple things. One is that this is, as everyone knows, this is the really the historic repository or the repository of the definitive repository of historical collections in the city. And we're very fortunate to have um, such a capable 
team of people running this organization and uh, really has its, uh, the best interests of its interests of it at heart. Um, as you know, the uh, traditionally the CPA has really been devoted towards uh, preserving, you know, physical buildings, basically. Um, so we, in, in order to be able to continue to support the, um, the institution beyond just its buildings, its physical shell, um, we took a vote to endorse um, designating the collections as historic um, in and of themselves. And so I think that opens up avenues for not only CPA funding, but also probably, hopefully additional funding as well. Um, so I would just say that the commission was unanimously in, unanimously in support of this. And um, I just will add my own reactions, personal reactions to the application. Um, again, Historic Northampton has continued to engage, I think some of the leading professionals in their fields that deal with textiles and furniture. Um, these are very important individuals to have involved. They are, are extremely experienced. They really appreciate the collection. And I think they'll do the best for it than we can possibly expect. So um, I would say that this is a great investment on the part of the city um, and, the, and the public um, residents of the city. Mm -hmm. Committee members, thoughts? Uh, let's see, I'll just go in order of what I'm seeing on the screen. Jeff, any comments you want to make? I no, would I think... um, <clears throat> endorse everything Martha just said. I think it was a um, uh, personal reaction was kind of exciting to read the proposal. And I think this is consistent with what um that organization has done from the time that i've been on the on this committee so i wholly support it chris yeah um wholehearted support yep uh jeff yeah i support it i think it was a great application and um i think it makes a makes sense to kind of invest um, beyond the buildings and in the actual collection and find ways to be able to share that. Um, so yeah, I'm in favor. Any comments? Did you Sorry. Say uh, can people hear me? Yes, so. uh, Jana. Okay, I wasn't sure if you said my name or not. Uh, uh, yes, wholehearted support. Um, and I would just add, I enjoyed hearing, I think it was at the last meeting about um, the how Historic Northampton kind of engaged the public and work around the um, efforts around the barn. And what I like seeing here too, is that it's a completely different way to engage the public making these materials available online. Um, and just shows sort of the um, creativity of the organization and thinking about just recognizing and making available the value of what they have. So wholehearted support. Uh, Beth? I would echo what everyone has said. This is not my area of expertise. I learned a lot in reading the proposal. I learned a lot in listening to all of the people who spoke. I was particularly um, uh, interested beyond that um, in the discussion about how um, things that belong to people um, can get lost in the history of time, whereas buildings stand there and you may not understand what they're about, but without stitching all of that together, you don't have a true sense of um, both the people and uh, the buildings. So in any event, uh, thank you for that education and I wholeheartedly support the uh, application. Jen? Yeah, I would echo everything that everybody said, wholehearted support. And I also, like Jana mentioned, really appreciate sort of the digital component of it. 
just making it accessible kind of beyond the physical and in person to people not here or not able to visit for whatever reason. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So for community folks listening, just, just to reassure you, we've had a chance to read proposals, to hear presenters present their proposals, to have both written questions as well as verbal questions and get the answers to those, and now to hear public comments. So if you think we're sort of rushing to judgment here, we really aren't. It does take us um, weeks, weeks to get there. Uh, so is there, so again, we're, we're doing this shopping cart thing where we make motions to put things in the shopping cart. That doesn't mean we're checking them out, but uh, um, it can expedite the process. Is there a motion from someone about historic Northampton that we could put in the shopping cart? Move to fully fund. Thank I'll second that. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion from committee members? Uh, Sarah, I think we do a roll call even on the shopping cart. Is that right? <laughs> uh, if we are moving forward with a um, a vote, then yes, we would need a yeah. Let's do that. We need a roll call. All right. Um, so I I think I have everybody on the committee, but if I miss you at the end, please jump in. Um, Jana. Yes. Jeff Dawson. Yes. Jen. Yes. Chris. So wait, I'm just before I, I'm a yes, but this is just the cart. This is not final approval, right? Correct. Aye. Jeff Jones? Yes. Uh, Bev? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Okay. It is fully funded in the shopping cart. It has not been checked out yet. Let's move on to bathroom ventilation with Forbes Library. And I'd, I'd like to ask Sarah again to revisit this issue of whether ventilation meets historic preservation uh, criteria or guidelines. And as folks may remember from our last meeting a couple of weeks ago, it was mentioned that um, there was an extensive renovation done in 1998, is it? Is that right? Uh, and at that time, ventilation was still an issue there, but was not addressed. And that, in fact, was a violation of the codes back in 1998. And that opens up, Sarah, can you just talk a little bit more how, how that's relevant? Yeah, so the, um, uh, the Community Preservation Act specifies different types of projects that can be funded. You know, there's a lot of different projects that the committee has seen over the years that unfortunately just weren't eligible for CPA funding, but were great ideas. Um, so uh, under historic preservation, uh, one of the things that can be eligible is improvements to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act and other federal, state, or local building or access codes, or to make them more um, suitable. I trying, can't find the exact words, but more basically more suitable for their intended use. And all of those historic projects also have to meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards for whatever type of work is being proposed, be it restoration or rehabilitation. But you know, those few words are the only guidance that the Department of Revenue provides, unfortunately. So there, there is a lot of interpretation to be left at the local level. We asked, you, you sent an email out to Stuart Saginaw, I think you may have called him as well, asking for the Community Preservation Coalition take on this, and they have not responded. Is that correct? He did. I, I mean, he didn't, he didn't respond. I got an out of office response, but I know Devin mentioned that she had also reached out to the coalition and had gotten a response. So that may be helpful as well. Uh, can we call on Devin? Devin, you're here, right? Um, I am. I, you, I didn't speak with speak Stuart. Uh, yeah, I didn't speak with Stuart. I spoke with one of his, um, staffers who pointed me to the database of projects that had been done with CPA with CPC funding. Well, it was CPA funding. And um, there were ventilation projects on that, but I would have to say in all honesty, having looked over the history of funding is no guarantee. It's, it's much more as Sarah said at your discretion. Um, no one doubts that 
the building is a historic building and under rehabilitation, you can certainly deal with mechanical systems. So it that's those are almost given in this case. Um, I think at issue, the question Sarah posed to the library and that was answered in writing and the reason that the uh, engineer and civil, the uh, central services person spoke to you at the last meeting was to talk about the issue of why it, it didn't meet zoning requirements for air ventilation in 1998. If it had met that, then what I said to you in the last meeting was, there are many historic buildings around town that are not currently up to zoning standards. That's just the nature of old buildings. But but the thing that we're sort of pointing out here is this one didn't meet it when it was last worked on. Um, I'm happy to say no one here dealing with this project now was part of that problem, but it also means we can't explain to you why that was the case. But because it didn't meet standards in 1998, Fixing it now is important. Thank you, Devin. Martha? Yes, I, I did not attend the last meeting, and um, but I did listen, I did watch the tape of the meeting. And one of the questions I have is how is it that the library got a certificate of occupancy for this in 1998 when it didn't meet code? Uh, Lisa, I don't know if you're prepared to answer that. You were not the director at that time, uh, but any insight on that? Oh, she's left. It's <laughs> something I said the way that I said it. I know it's a sensitive topic, bathroom ventilation, but I Sorry to keep everyone waiting. My oh, neighbor shows up just as this my dog started barking. It's just as you asked that. I I, I apologize for that. I'm I'm not sure. Um, I, you know, I really um I've asked around. There are there's some there's some folks that are still in the community. Um I I think I in my my guess is, and this is I'm not, you know, this is not my field of expertise. I'm a librarian, but I think that there was the sense that the, the door opening and closing would provide the fresh air that like that was sort of checked checked the box in terms of the amount of, of air movement is the only thing I can think of. And that that's just never proven to be true as anybody who's stepped foot in these bathrooms can tell you. So so why 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 it was deemed acceptable at the time, I, I'm just really not sure. Yeah, I can't. It just never has worked. For, I've been in the building a long time, and it's it's not a new problem. It's 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 always been bad, and it's more evidently bad now that the building use has grown over over time. It's also a busier building. It's about one uh, third busier. What like twenty percent to thirty five percent busier than it was twenty years ago. So, thank you, Lisa. Um, Sarah, if if we were to uh, vote to approve funding for Forbes. Would you send it on to uh, the town's attorney to take a look at what what would be the process so we know we're doing the the uh, the legal thing? If 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 in fact we voted to approve money, yeah. If the committee desired, we could certainly present a draft order to the city solicitor and uh, see if he had any concerns about funding the project as it was proposed. Okay, thank you. Um, can we go back to Martha uh, as our historic person? And if you could weigh in and then we'll go around and hear what other folks have to say. Yeah, sure. Um, the commission did not actually review this application, but I'm happy to um, weigh, in it, weigh in on it um, as a committee member. Um, I, I just wholly support um, public libraries in general. I think they have become our community hubs in so many um, towns, municipalities across the country, and they provide so many functions and they are true democratic institutions. And the fact that they don't push, you know, push people away, they don't um, close the door on anybody. Um, I just think that we need to keep supporting them. Um, and then this one in particular, because it has such a, a diversity of 
offerings, you know, anywhere from children's to providing shelter for needy, um, need people uh, to housing a presidential library, which is quite remarkable. So I, I think we, um, this is a great investment of our money to keep this institution alive and thriving. And, and Martha, from what you know of the, of code issues and all, do you, do you think this is appropriate as a historic preservation project? Um, I, I, I do in the sense that, um, if it were being done today, um, it would be done prop. Well, if the 98 renovation was being done as it, in it, the whole totality of it that was done in 98 were being done today, it would be done properly. But from what I have read in the application and from the presentations, I think that um, the approach, the design of the system is very much in keeping with the Secretary of the Interior standings and in that the, um, the work is all being internal, being done internally. They are, are gonna have to break into walls, but the work will be concealed. And so I think the inter historical integrity of the building will be maintained from what I understand. Uh, thanks, Martha. So we'll go around and have people comment, Jeff. Um, for me, I think if, um, if the proposal was to build a new bathroom or bathrooms where none currently existed, I think it would be problematic, but the proposal is not that. It's to upgrade um, already existing facilities. It's to do so in a historic building. It's to do so in a historic building that already has um, air filtration systems for other part in the collections area, which is what I asked about at the last meeting. So uh, I'm in support of the proposal. Beth? Um, I always support working bathrooms. Uh, that was a joke, uh, but it's true. Uh, but uh, the word discretion was used by someone, Sarah perhaps, and to the extent that we have the discretion uh, to, to fund this, it seems fundamental protecting this asset. So I strongly support it. Chris? Sorry, I'm having trouble with my unmute button. Um, I strongly support it as well. I But I don't see any reason why we can't delay a decision until we've heard from the city solicitor on it. Uh, Martha, we've heard Jeff. I support it. I think it's a vital community asset. Um, as one of the newer members, I don't know what level of um, discretion um, we use when providing resources and thinking about mechanical updates, but this one seems to make sense to me. And then also just looking at um, some of the decision guidelines for CPA projects. Um, you know, this in my mind checks some of the boxes under the historic CPA decision guidelines. So um, I'm in favor for it. Uh, Jenna? Um, I'm in favor and would also appreciate the opportunity to hear from attorney Seawald before officially moving forward just to get that extra layer of comfort. But assuming that we hear back from him that it seems okay, then um, I would be in support of funding the project. Jen? It's hard to go later because everyone says all the things that I want to say. I echo what Jana just said. I'm in support of it. Um, I also just want to, I would be comforted by the assurance that it was within our purview as a historic project, but um, it is not in any way sort of um, not um, supporting this historic building. So I don't have any personal concerns and I think it's a very worthwhile project that will serve the people of Northampton. So I'm in favor. Uh, just a couple things to add. Um, one is, and Lisa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, when we heard presentations two weeks ago, uh, no bids have come up on this. So this would go out to bid 
and I assume you try to get three bids for this project. So I think it's a ballpark number that was presented. I'm not sure where that number came from. It seems high to me, but what, what do I know about bathroom ventilation? Uh, um, but anyway, the, one of the conditions of course would be to, to get three bids and, or as many bids as you can get. And then we would, we would take a look, look at that. Um, so that's, that's my only, my only uh, suggestion or condition. Uh, in the past, we put conditions on proposals. I mean, we can do two things tonight. One is to uh, delay voting at all uh, on this proposal until Sarah presents it to uh, the town attorney for uh, for his his eyes on it to make sure that it meets it, it's legal and we're and, and we're doing the right thing. Another thing would be another alternative would be to vote on it tonight. And the condition that we would have put on that is that it's run through the town attorney for their for their approval. Uh, so um, we can go either either way on that. Uh, vote tonight with the condition on it. Not vote tonight and wait until we hear back from. Is it C, is it uh, Alan Seawold? Is that is that it? Yeah. And and can, is he? Uh, what what is his timeline for getting stuff back to you, Sarah? If we present this to him, uh, if, if he knows that there's a deadline, I'm I'm sure that by the next meeting, which is actually in in three weeks, um, because of the mm -hmm. the last week of the month, wouldn't be an issue. Okay, so uh, so we would be assured of at least having that within three weeks for the for the next meeting. So uh, how do committee members want to proceed? Should we put this off for three weeks or vote on it now with the condition if in fact we're approved, if we approve it, um, which it sounds like folks are leaning to, the condition being that Alan C will review that and then we uh, how 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 should we do this? Any suggestions? Martha? I would suggest that we vote on whether to fund or not, um, just because there doesn't seem to be a lot of division um, amongst the committee members about supporting it. And and then revisit if we need to, once we have the attorney's review. Okay, uh, let's see, Chris, you were the one who suggested putting the vote off. Is there? Uh, I don't, I, I'm willing to do it provisionally. Okay, I think we had a couple of other folks. I think maybe it was Jana and Jen wanting to put it off as well. Are you both of you okay with a vote? Yeah, okay. I, I would prefer the latter, the provisional voting for it with the provision of its run through the attorney. Okay. Um, I'm also wondering, Sarah, and this is sort of awkward that that um, the Q Community Preservation Coalition asks for our dues at a time when they would not get back to us about the one <laughs> issue perhaps that we've asked all year for them to get back to us. I mean, that's, that's just really annoying. And it would Duly be really noted. Nice. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and I know it, it sounds like, you know, Stuart was on vacation or out of the office for a, a, a week, but that was a few weeks ago. So I'm wondering whether, um, and, and if it would be helpful for me to do it as chair or for you to do it again and say, Stuart, here's the issue. Is there a, any any thoughts? Can you run that by him one more time? I don't. Yeah, and I can certainly follow up with him. Um, but I suspect that since this is a complicated issue that it doesn't really seem to have come up previously for another community or at the state level, that they might not even be willing to, to provide an opinion in any case and would probably just refer us to, to our own uh, local council. Because, in, and Devin, it's not that we don't appreciate the work that you did on researching this, but I don't think any of the ventilation systems that other CPCs have, have uh, funded were, were specific to this issue with the, the bathroom ventilation. So I don't know if that makes a difference or, or, or not. Um, so I'm hearing uh, uh, that, that people are not adverse to sort of voting on this provisionally uh, tonight. 
with the condition that it passed muster through our for, through Alan Seawald, who's the, the 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 city attorney, and uh, and that bids go out um, uh, for for work for work that is done. So those are can can anyone else think of any addition? And, and our usual conditions are it, it meets historic preservation standards. I don't know if that's the case with this one, Sarah, as well. That that condition would be attached onto this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is there a motion out there for the for Ford's library? So moved. For full funding, Bob? Yes. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion from committee members? Jeff? Um, I would just ask Sarah to make sure the minutes reflect the frustration that the committee has had with the state coalition um, CPC, because that's, I think that's a good thing for all of us to remember. That's all. So we have moved and seconded to fully fund the 60, I can't read my own writing, 60,500. Um, for the bathroom ventilation at Forbes Library. Sarah, can you take us through a roll call on that, please? Absolutely. Um, Jana? Yes. Jeff D? Yes. I'll just do them both at the same time. Jeff Jones? Yes. Jen? Yes. Chris? Yes. Bev? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Uh, committee members, any other conditions that we want to put on uh, Forbes, the Forbes Library one? So most importantly being that this is a, this is a legal thing. Any, any other conditions? If, if we can step back for a moment, just while we're talking about conditions, are there any conditions we want to put on the historic Northampton uh collections that we can think of yes no bless you beverly and and for the next meeting i will have draft orders for the cpc to review i didn't have them prepared for this meeting since you, you've never actually made the final decisions at a public comment session we've not usually had the chance to do that Okay, so we move through two of our three miracles on miracles. It's only a 10. Um, so last but certainly not least is Smith Charities. It is our the biggest ask of the uh, of the of the funding cycle. Um, once again, I think it'd be nice to hear from Martha as our historic person. Um, Martha, your comments. Yes, so the Historical Commission did review this application. And, uh, you know, we all know this is a very important historic building, um, not only for the fabric of the downtown, but also the community as a whole, um, the William Fenno, William Fenno Pratt building. Um, the uh, Smith Charities organization has done a fantastic job of getting the right professionals involved. Um, they did a very comprehensive historic structures report and have engaged um, very skilled professionals to guide them through this process. I will note that um, when just one correction that um, the uh, Structures North, who is the engineer for the project is actually not a Mason, they're engineers. So they will not be actually doing the work on the building. It would be somebody else. That was something that was um, misstated in the presentation that was made two weeks ago. So I think that, um, you know, as a historic building, a historic resource in this city, um, obviously the commission supports it. Um, if you, you know, from my own point of view, just a couple of comments I wanted to make more than, um, or maybe they're questions. Um, there was a comment made at last meeting's presentation about the operation of the organization and it, it's only costing $15,000 a year for Smith Charities to operate out of the building. And that was reiterated in a letter that David Murphy had submitted as part of the application. And I just I want to I just want to clarify that question that because I think that there are 
um, we are being presented with thousands of dollars of deferred maintenance on this building that are not being uh, um, incorporated into those operating costs. Um, and it's, I, I think it's erroneous to think that you can continue to operate for $15,000 a year over the long term, given the needs of this historic structure. And they're going to continue. Um, maybe the exterior gets redone, but then there'll be interior problems. So um, the thought of you know selling it and that whole comp, um, computation that was made, I just think that needs to be looked at a little more carefully. And I'm gonna defer my um, comments about support after I hear from the others. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Beth? So I really appreciate Martha's question. Again, um, this is not uh, the professional space that I've worked in. I will confess that I've had an interest in understanding more about the operations of the charity. I've had an interest in understanding more about um, the uh, grant making activities of the charity. Maybe that's just a matter of interest because this is about preserving a very important building. Uh, clearly some people came out tonight to talk about how the charity has um, changed their lives. And that's great to me. Um, I do think that if we look at this um, organization for future funding, it would help me to understand more about the social human impact of the charity. Um, and maybe that's not relevant. I'm rel for those who don't know, I'm relatively new to this to this board. Um, you know how to weigh the historic preservation benefits relative to the um, uh, social impact benefits. Um, having said all of that, I am inclined to support the request for funding because it's clearly a very important building. Um, but. I suspect we may see them again. So that's why I thought I'd add the other questions. Um, I also was not at the last meeting, uh, apologize for that. So if some of those questions were answered, forgive me. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Jen? Jen or Jana? Jen, you. Oh. I was hoping I would go later this time. <laughs> no, we could. You, you were um, <laughs> um, I'm still undecided on this one, mainly for that question that Martha raised. I mean, it's clearly a historic, an important historic building in the downtown of Northampton. Um, I, as you guys know, historically tend to look at these historic preservation projects from a really like strict lens of like, is the resource worth investing in? And in this case, I think, yes, absolutely. My question kind of lies more closely in the sort of deferred maintenance versus historic preservation question. And I don't know that I personally have the expertise to know that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about. And I'm, um, just waiting to hear from my other commissioners as I sort of mull this over and think about my decision. Thank you. Jana? Um, I think I feel similarly to my colleagues and you know, very much appreciating and supporting the building as an important historic structure that in theory, I want to support and in practice, you know, I think we talked about this the last funding round that we're just seeing round after round of applications for us to be funding these repairs and their the organization's difficulty in finding other sources of funding, which though very real, you know, presents us with, you know, the more projects we fund, the more I think applications we're going to see in the future. And that's, that's not a maintenance plan. And I don't really know how to solve that. But I really appreciate the way that Martha phrase the question of, you know, I think maybe internally the organization needs to rethink the way that they're um, planning for their operating costs. Um, and 
I don't know where that leads us in terms of a decision. I, I, I very much want to see the building, you know, continue to be, um, have structural integrity and, and um, be a presence in town. And, and I do appreciate what the organization has pointed out that it's not just the building, but that the same organization is continuously operating in it, that there is something special about that. Um, but I'm still have some sort of doubts. So looking forward to hearing from others. Carol, we'll defer, I will defer calling on you until we hear from other committee members. And then uh, Chris. Yeah, I, I, I want to start by also thanking Martha for her framing. Um, this has been a, this has been a, um, a, 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 a grantee that, that whose, whose applications have troubled me from the onset uh, for the reasons that we've raised. And I think the way I've, having listened to my colleagues, the way I'm framing it for myself right now is um, that um, the way I view CPC funds is that they are designated for renovation, restoration, but not operation. Um, and I think we're walking a really fine line here on this one. Um, having said that, however, I'm, there's another part of me that says, okay, what happens to the structure? And, and I'm just gonna go aside quickly and, and give you give Bev my two cents. I don't think the function performed in a building um, and let, uh, is, is, carries a lot of weight with me. Uh, it, when you're when you're talking about historical, um, the function the, the function could be performed anywhere. The building is the building. Um, so I, you know, so I, I circle back at the the question of restoration versus operation. Um, but the fact remains, uh, what happens to the building? Um, if we're not here to to offer assistance, and um, that that that's the part that I that that still has me uh, sort of um, connected to connected to it because I, I we're not here to fund operations and and we're getting really close on this one so that's where I'm at. Uh, Jeff Dawson. Hi there. So as a new member and this being my first round, um, you know, I just rely on going and looking at the other projects that were approved um, under this category and the similar type of work um, that was done. And based on the application that was submitted, um, it appears to me that it's a very similar ask from these other projects. Um, I appreciate everyone else's point of view, but I would also you know, like to play devil's advocate a little bit and say that, um, you know, operationally are these questions that we are asking other institutions that we have support, you know, supported in the past, whether it was the Academy or the courthouse or Forbes, um, you know, looking at these other institutions that similarly are nonprofits and if they generated a revenue, it's very slim, or in this instance, it's a fund. Um, and just the fact that it is an entity that's been here for as long as it has um, in the same building. I think something that would be a recommendation, um, you know, to Smith Charities, and I think Carol spoke to last um, meeting, was, you know, finding a way to make the building and institution a little bit more accessible so that people could realize they could go in and see it. Um, you know, to, to provide that, that service a little bit more. Um, but generally, I think based on the type of work that's being done, um, you know, the uniqueness of the building, um, you know, I, I think for me, it, it aligns with what um, CPA funds are supposed to do. Uh, Jeff Jonah. <clears throat> So um, first of all, Jen, I know what you're talking about coming last in line. So here we go. Um, so I have to echo a lot of the <clears throat> previous comments. Um, um, I don't doubt um, 
the work that Smith Charities has done through the decades. Um, um, but like somebody else said, I think the proposal before us tonight is about the building and not um, the charitable work um, that they've done. Um, I think this, this committee um, has always been um, troubled by the, <clears throat> the funding sources that um, most of the proposals that come before us are um, CPA money is used to leverage other funding and, and things move along. And we have had, at least in my time, we have had a couple of projects that uh, it seemed that the proposal came over and over again to fund different parts, um, one after the other, and and eventually it, it, at least my memory is it it kind of played out. So the, the last time we considered this, uh, I believe we just ended up uh, funding some of the most uh, what were deemed the most important parts of it at that particular time. So I'm somewhere in in that in that area. Um, it's a very historically significant building. I just, I still find myself, um, and this is not my area of expertise, but I just can't think that, help but think that there, there have to be other sources of funding that could be um, used um, to get done um, what um, Smith Charities hopes to get done when the whole project is, is put together and completed. So um, I, I mean, I would, <clears throat> I would support probably funding part of it, um, but I can't tell you what part, um, that would probably undertake a whole, a whole, um, a whole separate meeting, um, to try and break that down. It seemed much more apparent at our, our, our last funding round, what the, what that section would have been, um, but it is a it is a great building. Um, it it's part of what makes Northampton Northampton. Um, but I'm very um, very much up in the air about um, CP um, our committee CPC being the what appears to be the sole source of funding um, to get this done. And I would echo other comments um, that have already been made about um, deferred maintenance versus historic preservation. And if we were to fund it, might we um, be very stringent with our conditions? And I guess that would be a question for Sarah is could we do something that would enter into some kind of an analysis of um, exactly what is, what are we dealing with here is in terms of what percentage are we dealing with deferred maintenance and, and what are we actually dealing with historic preservation? Because we have a, we have a review um, study that is now uh, dated, that has been done. This is not like it's hot off the press um, three months ago. This is, this is something that, um, we've had to work with uh, for some time and I'll leave it there. Have we heard from everybody? Yes. Oh, uh, I had just a couple quick comments. Um, and one is the, uh, so again, like, like everyone else, I go down for an instant, one, the good work that Smith Charities do to the historic integrity and this iconic uh, structure in Northampton that is well worth preserving. The things that that bother me the most have already been said by other committee members. One is that uh, I mean, look at other applicants and they're really getting a lot of, of, of funding from additional sources. Um, we are not the sole source funder as we just about are. I know there's a state historic grant that uh, that that they're going out for, and that's 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 troubling. The second thing that's troubling is the lack of public uh, 
access to the building. And again, I think it's been said that people can come in at any time, but I think people don't know that, they don't know how to get in, they don't know if it's ever been open. And again, that's not to say we don't fund buildings for that the exterior is, is uh, work is, is, is what we're doing. All that being said, you know, we did fund this big study a number of years ago. Jeff, Jeff ad, uh, accurately referred to it as outdated, but we did fund that. We funded the, fir the, the, the first major round of work that was done. Um, so we're in pretty deep on this. And a lot of me wants to finish the job. I mean, it's, it, 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 that doesn't answer the issue of, is this deferred maintenance or is this historic preservation? Um, uh, and I, I'm gonna kick that back to Sarah and ask her to comment on that. Uh, or maybe back to Marth again. Um, but I, 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 I think we've had this discussion already in the first round. And again, they, those were higher priority items that we voted on uh, whenever that was, what, a year and a half ago or something? Uh, but again, we're in. And and I guess I'd like, I'm thinking maybe we should just stay in rather than getting out after a big study in a, in a, in a big first round. Um, but Sarah, can you comment on this deferred maintenance versus, not versus, uh, uh, and historic preservation. And Martha, I don't know if you have comments on that as as well. Carol, we'll get to you in just a little bit. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, it, it would take some additional analysis, I think, to figure out exactly what might be a, the result of deferred maintenance versus, you know, needed restoration work over, you know, the building's been there for more than 100 years. Um, so, you, you need to sit down and figure out what maintenance might have prevented some of this work in the long run. I mean, it, for a, a large building like this that, that does have ongoing needs, there is you know, some expectation of that every hundred years or so, or maybe more, maybe less, you, that you will have some significant rehabilitation costs, regardless of how much has been put into the structure. Um, but you know, for a building that may not have had anything done ever, that cost is certainly going to increase. But I, you know, I would, it's really difficult to be able to provide numbers to go along with that. And as far as you can tell though, this, the proposal itself meets historic preservation guidelines. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay, uh, Martha? Yeah, I think Sarah's right about that. Um, and that, you know, that's not so much my issue because I think they have gone about doing this in the right way. They absolutely have. And I think that people that are working on it are skilled and it's a building worth preserving and all of that. I guess I don't mean to sound harsh, but I'm not convinced that this is the greatest steward of this building long term um, because they don't have the ability to um, increase their revenue stream to fundraise and it's going to continue to have, um, you know, problems. I mean, I live in an old house and it, you know, it's just constant and you can't let it go for years and years on end. Um, I'm sure all the rest of, a lot of you do too. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, and Brian, I also, I do concur with you. I think it's important for the job to get finished, but then I also think that we need to suggest to this institution that they really take a hard look at their ability to take care of this. And and um, I think Chris was right in saying that um, the function of Smith Charities, while it's been historically in this building and the building was built for that, um, it doesn't need to take place there. Um, people can you know, issue mortgages and grants and that kind of thing from a lot of different types of facilities. So um, you know, maybe there's a better steward for it maybe, um, I don't know, a private developer. I, I mean, I'm just putting those things out there. But I do agree, Brian, that it's important for us to kind of leave our mark and to get the job done. But again, I would like to see Smith Charities to take, really take a hard look at what their capability is long-term and what the plan is for that. Chris? Uh, yeah, so, um, I, 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 you know, I, I also agree with you, Brian, that um, we are invested in, and and it be it would be a shame not to to reap the benefit of the, uh, our previous investment. Um, I'm just not convinced that 
I see where that investment ends. Um, but I circle back to something that that uh, Martha just said, which is, you know, um, is this entity the, the proper steward for this for this property? And it gets me back to my question about if it's not us, who's it going to be? Um, I mean, one of the things that's come up in the discussion, not just this round, but in previous rounds, is that um, because of the because of a, a number of factors, but but uh, um, the historical restrictions um, being one of them. Uh, this isn't a great candidate for resale that there isn't necessarily a buyer out there for it that would then have the you know the desire and or the wherewithal to to put the money into it to do all the work that that may that needs to be done now and may need to be done in the future and and um you know so that that's where i find myself caught between wanting to you know fulfill the commitment that we've made and not turning it into an open-ended commitment um, where we don't know, you know, what, what it's going to mean three, five years down the road. Uh, Carol. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak and, and I appreciate all your candor. And, um, so I want to just try to address a few things. Uh, the first thing I want to address is, the question of deferred maintenance versus restoration. And I asked this question specifically to Dory Brooks, the uh, person who works with the architectural firm uh, with Jones Wissett Architects. And, and by the way, everything we're doing is straight out of that assessment that it's, I think it's like 70, 80 pages, which I sent to you. Uh, and, and it's true, it was done about a half decade ago and we're, it's a multi-phase project. So we got the first phase done. Thank, thank you for your help. And, and also thank you to the, uh, at each stage, we have gotten other funding, um, uh, you know, a $50,000 grant from Mass Historic. And we're applying uh, actually this month um, for a $100,000 grant from uh, uh, Mass Historic Preservation. So we are uh, we're definitely seeking other sources. Um, I, I did read in the Community Preservation Act uh, law or the intent of the law, and they said sometimes buildings, the old buildings are owned by entities that don't have the, the funds to, to do the, the very hefty cost of historic preservation. And, and you know, that's why they created the statue. And I think we're kind of the example for that. Like it's, it's sometimes the oldest buildings are owned by, by entities that um, are not developers who have really deep pockets. And, um, but, but let me get to the, the point that many of you raised. So um, I just want to read to you a paragraph um, from an email from Dory, the architect, who uh, her firm did the, the whole um, assessment. Um, and she said, uh, the proposed work, the bottom line is she doesn't think any of this is deferred maintenance. So that's the, the, the bottom line, but I'll read you exactly what she said. The proposed work addresses fundamental structural concerns in the building that was built in 1860 and has withstood significant aging and weathering that has deteriorated masonry features that allow the building to remain intact. These are not deferred maintenance issues. The work will preserve the exterior masonry on the south elevation and retie the roof framing to the exterior wall. Once complete, significant masonry restoration to the roof and facade should not be needed for several decades. I would guess the, the initial work held up for a century and a half, and that was with less good technology. Uh, we're having, as, as you stated, and by the way, thank you for Martha for clarifying that Stone Structures North is not the Masons. They, they, they've they overseen um, really sophisticated work from the, the State House in Boston, and they, they know what they're doing, but yes, they, they hire out uh, Masons. Um, anyway, um, but so, you know, if it took a century and a half for the building to start tearing, you know, tearing apart or the chimney needing to be rebuilt or the stone masonry parts to be rebuilt, you know, I think that it would be another century and a half before it would be needed again. But it, it is a costly process and it is a multi-stage process. So I, I think I've mentioned before, this is part two of three phases and, um, uh, I would love to get it all done. Um, you know, and also in terms of maintenance, like the 15,000, I shared that information with you about what 
what kind of maintenance is going on in the building. You know, we've replaced, you know, we've shorn up the boiler and the toilet systems and, and the, the air conditioning system and the security system and all of those were ongoing maintenance. And we didn't come to you for any of those costs because it's maintenance. And I know the statute doesn't allow for that. Um, but anyway, just, just if you want me to send you that language from the architect who said that this is definitely not deferred maintenance, it's, this is classic historic preservation, I, I'd be happy to send that to you. Um, uh, in terms of other grant sources, um, uh, Mass Historic, as you know, I, I hope we get the 100,000, that would be wonderful. Um, there's also, um, Sarah shared with me, um, uh, there's another $10,000 grant that uh, I inquired about last fall and uh, the deadline had already passed. But um, but there's other things like that I, we haven't come to you for, like uh, the doors need to be refinished, smaller projects that are, you know, the, the redoing the masonry work is, uh, you know, big tag item, uh, but we could get try for some of these smaller grants for the other things that are uh, smaller tag items um, and for the, you know, contribute to the bigger tag items. Um, uh, uh, other things. Um, so uh, the public access, you know, I, I've been thinking about, you know, what could we do about that? And um, it's, you know, right on our website, the hours that it's open and there's, we only have one staff member, but she's there from nine to three every day. Anyone could come in, but but you're right. Like who's going to just come in? You know, maybe we could do something like advertise a, a tour of this historic building. You know, maybe we could like host it somewhere and, you know, a couple of times a year, show people through. Um, I was mentioning at the last meeting, um, uh, I, I've, I enjoy art walks of different towns and sometimes a building that's not set up as an art gallery becomes an art gallery and the public comes in and you can, you know, and, you know, if there were, if that, if there were support for something like that, you know, if, if you felt like, you know, we should really emphasize that, I'd be open to something like that. I, I love supporting the arts and, you know, maybe people could walk in and be at least in the vestibule area where the, there's the vault, and there's the bank teller counters, but there's walls, you could hang things on walls. Uh, anyway, so, you know, I'd be happy to think creatively about how we could have the public have more access. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to bring that back to the group and hear suggestions and even meet with people if you want to brainstorm what we could do to, to invite the public in more. I don't know if Northampton has things like historic tours, but that's something I was thinking, like if there were historic Oh, oh, you do have historic tours. Oh, so that would be like, maybe we could coordinate and during one of your historic tours, we could just, you know, be on the tour. I think that would be lovely. And I, I totally support that. Um, and we could give, you know, tell the story of, you know, Oliver Smith and the contentious will and, you know, how um, Daniel Webster represented him. And I think, anyway, it's an amazing story. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, so I don't know that I've addressed everything, but the biggest thing I think that was raised was, is this deferred maintenance? And at least according to the architects that did this whole assessment, it, this is not deferred maintenance, it's it's historic preservation. And and hopefully, you know, once we finish all, all phases of the exterior, there shouldn't be anything more, you know, till all of us are dead and buried for the next century. Uh, yes, and for the interior, you know, we're, we're working on things. And uh, yeah, I think that there's, uh, I see Martha has her hand up. Sorry. Go ahead. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Carol. Martha? No, just that, um, Carol, I think the thing, thank you for your uh, answers. And I think all those things you were mentioning, you know, programming and access and so forth, that's what I'm talking about. Like, if you, it seems like the organization has to have some sort of long term plan if they want to hold on to this building and properly take care of it and, and be able to um, be prepared for. Um, um, maintenance that needs to take place on an ongoing basis and have the money to do that, they need to, you know, come up with some kind of long-term strategic plan for making that happen. Um, that's, that's all. And I think, you know, you have the germs of ideas there. So it seems like it's something that could be possible. Um, but I, I mean, I do, I do respect Dory and I think that, um, I, I, I'm not entirely convinced that this is maintenance that just, um, you know, that work that just appeared five years ago, you know, the deterioration that just appeared five years ago. I think this has probably been going on for many, many years and was just never addressed. And to me, that's deferred maintenance, but I'm not gonna argue semantics at this point. I, I think it definitely was 
historic preservation that could have been done 20 years ago. And we just got the assessment five years ago. And I see your point um, anyway, but thank you. Jen? Yeah, I know this is in our materials, but um, Carol, if you would mind just reminding me what phase three is both just a general overview of what that work is. And also like, if you have a like guesstimate of financial scale in relation to phase one and two, that would help me. Yeah, th thanks so much. Um, so um, all of these, uh, all of these phases are for the exterior. And, and this is part of why um, I think it's, uh, you know, I haven't, I didn't include anything about the interior in, in any of these proposals because the exterior is what the town sees. Like, you know, the, it's part of the historic downtown Northampton and that's what you walk by. So keeping, so each of the phases was addressing different facades of the building and different, uh, so, uh, and, and you know, the number um, is, I, I asked Dory, I was like, can you give me a ballpark? And, and uh, she she wasn't able to give me a ballpark. She she thought that um, well, and I'll just be very candid with you. She said there would be a three phase, a third phase. She says it could even be a fourth, but it depends on how much you can get done in the third phase. So I'm hoping I'm optimistically saying a third phase. Um, she did say it would be. I, I think her opinion was it would be cheaper than the other phases, like the what's what's been hit first, like the first phase of what got done um, already, um, they were doing the cornice. Well, that's a very elaborate thing in the front. Um, and um, and uh, I think they did some work with the keystones and, and now we're doing work on the, the chimney and also um, in the attic, there's um, collar ties that would, like the building is kind of pulling apart so it would hold them together. Um, so uh, I, I, I just don't know the exact number. And I think it also depends too on, um, you know, the point that like this assessment was done several years ago, um, I think like four or five years ago, the later it gets, the more expensive. And I, I mean, I, I would have loved to get the whole thing done at once, but I, it would be, if we came to you and said, could you please give us, you know, the whole amount, like that would be off the charts and we couldn't, you know, no one could fund that much from, you know, your committee. And so, so we were doing it in phases, but it also means that the more you put it off, everything gets more expensive, you know, like, like the cost of labor, look at inflation now. Uh, so I, Jen, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, or Ms. Smith, I don't have a good answer for you uh, about the numbers uh, because I asked the same thing to Dory and she's like, I, she just didn't, couldn't give me a number. Um, and maybe she also can't give me a number because it depends on when we do it, you know, like we, that we've, we've been coming like every couple, couple of years or two or three years to try to get through these phases. And I'm hoping that like, we can get the whole thing done. And then, then we'll be, we'll be, you know, the extra will be finished for the next 150 years. I could try to ask if you want more details, but I, I, she, she wouldn't give me a number last time I asked or couldn't give me, I don't think she was like, I'm not going to give you a number. She just really couldn't assess it. Thank but you, you know, you, you 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 might look at the report though. She did put numbers in when this came in like five years ago. There were numbers uh, that the back like five or ten pages have numbers. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, the architects know exactly which things have already been ticked off the list. But you might you might look in the back of that report. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Jeff Jones. Sure, thanks, Brian. <clears throat> um, my um, reference to the assessment res report was was primarily because of what Carol just said about the um, the time gap between when it was done and where we are now in terms of cost. That that was my main thing. That the numbers were being uh, used. Um, the longer this goes, the less credible they seem to be because and this is pre-COVID I believe too um, but one reason to fund it would be and that's been said by uh, several other, other committee people is that usually at this point <clears throat> um, we don't have this much money in the till and we don't have this few proposals to consider in round two 
of a fiscal year, we're usually overrun by proposals. And then we're like, well, what are we going to do? They're all good. How are we going to divide this up? <clears throat> so this might be a rare opportunity um, to bring this home or at least get it closer to coming home that we may not have in the next year. You know, who knows what we're going to get in the fall and the spring and the the new funding sources that we're going to get. So I would just throw that out there for consideration. Thanks, Jeff. Bev? Yeah, um, I'm circling back on um, some of my own initial thoughts on this. And, you know, someone mentioned the concept of stewardship. Um, I have worked with lots of nonprofits and lots of buildings. And there is an intersection between the steward and the building. Um, and I'm not making any judgments about this steward. I don't know anything about this steward. Maybe I should know more. Um, but it strikes me that there are two things that um, if this group wants to continue to support this work might be helpful. And one is more information about the steward and their own um, prospects for the future and fundraising and all that stuff. But also it is customary to have both a rehab plan and a capital improvement plan um, that would extend out over as many as 15 years or however long into the future you can imagine that talks about additional improvements that you anticipate making because buildings continue to age or because standards for what buildings need to have in their bathrooms continue to evolve. Um, and so I'm wondering if um, either as a condition to this funding or um, as a condition to future funding, uh, we wanna talk about some additional information that the uh, committee could rely on about the combination of stewardship and the adequacy of both the operating and the anticipated rehab budget. Um, I understand that's more money for you to spend, updating the numbers, updating the forecasts, and thinking about the intersection between um, capital improvements, uh, uh, operations, if you will, and uh, more significant rehab, but might be one way for us to keep going. Um, Bev, could you... Uh put that in a sentence, a condition or two sentences that you were proposing? Well, I'm interested in other people's thoughts about whether they want more information before making a funding commitment now, or whether the biggest uh, concern is you will be back. We know you'll be back. So here's what, if you come back, uh, would be important to us. Um, you know, as Jeff said, we are in the, um, uh, a nice space of having enough money to fund this. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I guess my instinct is to approve this, but to do so um, with the, uh, yeah, I guess you can't really call it a condition, but the message that in order to consider future funding, we're gonna need a more robust plan, uh, both for the operations of the organization and the uh, uh, caretaking of the building. And that would be my proposal. Um, so it's not a condition of this funding, but rather, you know, call it what you will, a uh, advice um, for a subsequent funding proposal. You know, uh, as we've all said, I think we all worry when you go out to bid, are you going to have enough money to actually do the stuff that was in this phase, but that's kind of another another piece of this. I know that wasn't a sentence, Brian, but uh, I'm interested. It was a nice, was a nice one on sentence. <laughs> uh, Chris, right. The closer we get to nine, the shorter it, it will be. Chris, you had talked about um, conditions as well. Was there any specific ones that you might propose? I'm I'm nowhere near close enough to putting it into two sentences. Although I found Bev's <laughs> Bev's, um, Bev's formulation to be really 
really useful. Um, this idea that there's, you know, there, there need to be more than one plan and, and more than one approach to the long-term solvency of, of, of what's going on here. I'd love to hear, sorry to put you on the spot, spot Martha, but I'd like, I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts on that. No, I completely agree. And I, Bev, I think you've worded that perfectly. That's exactly what, um, you know, I was aiming at and my, that was, those were my reactions to this whole, you know, situation. So um, I think if we can maybe trim the language down a bit, or maybe even not, um, I would support that. And I, I would support moving ahead with funding um, with the condition perhaps that we, um, it, future proposals, which we're probably going to get, um, they need to have some of their more organizational ducks in line. Uh, let's see, who haven't we heard from lately? Jana? Um, yeah, I appreciate, Bob. Thanks for that. I was thinking, I mean, my organization is very, very different, but we had a, a somewhat related situation where for years we'd been relying on soft funding from the Mellon Foundation. And ultimately they said, look, we like you, we support you, we want you to continue, but we're funding your operations, your day-to-day -day operations, and that's not really what we're here for. And so they gave us a sort of bridge funding to allow us some time to get our ducks in a row so that we could become sustainable into the future. And so I've been sitting here thinking, what would the equivalent here be? And I think, um, you know, encouraging uh, Smith Charities to think internally about that, to provide us with more information. And if a piece of that is maybe coming back to us to get some support to come up with that plan, you know, that might be a piece of this as well. But I think we all want to see the work completed and don't want to be you know, funding this in perpetuity. So how can we move both of those goals together, uh, forward together? So um, I like the direction that we're headed. Uh, Jeff Dawson. I just appreciate everyone's input. Um, I think some of the important takeaways are that, you know, there's been the work being done is based on um, a study that uh, was funded by funds from the CPA and to kind of walk away at this point um, seems like a bad idea. Um, and as the other Jeff mentioned, in a unique situation where there is funding and a less competitive funding cycle. Um, and I think regardless of conditions, um, I'm pretty sure Carol has heard loud and clear that um, the institution she's representing today needs to um, think about, you know, other funding sources for um, their institution, as well as finding ways to engage the community um, to, you know, convey the work that they are doing and have done um, and, you know, share share the, the building in a public way um, in some ways that were even mentioned tonight. So, um, yeah, I just appreciate the conversation and I think some um, good points have been made. Other committee members have things to say on this? Jen? Yeah, just really quickly, I agree with what everyone said and I like the direction we're going in. And I think, I mean, I think I would need to see less of that sort of long-term plan if there was more match presented as part of this grant or, you know, like not grant funding, but, you know, fundraised from the community or from the organization. Like that, that's the piece to me where, like that also feels missing, but I also, share my fellow co commissioners desire like I want this work to get done I see the historical importance of this building and I'd love to kind of yeah I just I echo what everyone said of like moving it forward in this direction and also having some of that assurance of the sustainability of the plan kind of over time so your dog is adorable if he or she or they have anything to say or bark, please let us know. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and vote now, uh, put this into the shopping cart. It, I, I'm still a little confused as to whether, the, you know, what's the difference between a request and a condition. 
or advice and a condition is that if we're to vote on this now, do we do we want to put a condition that, uh, I mean, we I think we've had this discussion before, do, do we tie the hands of uh, future committee members to say we will not fund you again unless you do this? I think we're, we've been hesitant to ever do that. Um, so I don't know if, it, if, if it's a condition or if uh, Carol it can, continues to nod her head, like she's hearing, hearing what, what, what we're saying, is that good enough, is that good enough for us? Uh, or do we want to formalize in, 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 into a, into a condition that we would, that we would put on funding? Uh, it's it's a little bit challenging, even if the committee wanted to go that route, um, in, unless it's something that would make sense to formalize in a council order, which I'm not sure this would. Um, it, it's not anything that would be able to extend beyond the life of the contract. So any future CPC would be basically taking an, an application at, as a fresh start and a new look. So Sarah, you're suggesting that this go in the advice column category, yeah, rather yeah. than the than a, than a formal condition as uh, as we're doing with um, with Forbes Library. We will not fund unless the city attorney gives gives a thumbs up. Yeah, I mean it's not the same type of situation where it's a legal question as to whether something can be funded. You know, it's more the the pleasure of the committee and the feeling that these are necessary items that need to be completed before additional funding can be made. And, and that's really not something that can be um, formalized in a contract. Thanks for that clarification, Sarah. Chris? So Sarah, but we can stipulate what some of the money ought to be spent on, am I correct? Yeah, I, I mean, as far as, outlining exactly what can be done with the CPA funding. That's usually just, you know, in accordance with your grant application, here's some money to do the things that you wanted to do. So um, I want to circle. If, oh, yeah. if the okay. committee wanted to set yeah. aside a certain amount of funds to do a particular thing, that could absolutely be specified. In the so I want to circle back to something that Jenna said, which was, and we've done this before, um, which was provide uh, funding for, um, some sort of planning document um, that that would accompany uh, any future representation and, and give them the resources to do that um, in preparation for the fact that we know there's going to be around three and you know who knows maybe around four uh, and stipulate that some of the money here be be earmarked for um, some form of I don't know. Maybe Jenna, you can you can put the words for what it ought to look like. But just 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 a, you know, explain to them that our expectation is is that um, we want we want some of the money we're we're giving you here to help you with the next step, and and this is what we think it might look like. I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but it's a thought. Jenna. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that would look like, but I'm thinking about, and I'm sorry, my mind's not pulling back the details, but the project, um, that was to, um, house, um, unhoused individuals up on the far side of Smith, um, where the folks were really excited about it, but it all felt a little bit, um, like they might need some additional expertise to help them solidify the plan. And so I believe we placed a condition on that project that we wanted them to engage a consultant. Um, so I'm thinking something similar here. I'm not exactly maybe in kind of uh, uh, that views the capital improvement plan, strategic planning. I'm not exactly sure how to categorize the kind of consultant that they would need, but, um, and I don't know enough about the operations of their organization to know what capacities they have and, and what the funding's how they could best utilize the funding. Um, but I, I think that's where my mind goes in terms of thinking about a model for, for how we might build that condition into this round of, you know, earmark these particular funds for that future planning. Uh, 
and any funds that were to be expended would also need to be eligible under CPA. So, you know, a, a general financial plan, for example, wouldn't be something that would be eligible. Um, like with the Five Franklin Street project, the consultant was directly related to the creation of affordable housing. So that's something that was clearly eligible. Um, so it would be it would need to be something that fit under the umbrella of historic preservation. Beth? Uh, it strikes me, correct me, uh, for those of you who've been looking at this longer, uh, that one of the concerns is whether the numbers that were done five years ago are any good anymore, maybe even the scope. Um, so what if what we asked for was an updated uh, scope of work and uh, financial forecast, um, the stuff that's a little bit softer in terms of um, uh, stewardship and whether or not the charity has the resources to fund ongoing maintenance and all of that could be assessed by us or some future group uh, as part of the request for information in that proposal. But it would perhaps make everybody feel a bit better if we thought the numbers were more real um, than five-year-old numbers are in this day and age. And that we could fund, right? We could fund an update on the capital needs, the excuse, excuse me, the uh, rehab estimate. Um, and uh, Carol could then answer the question that someone asked, uh, what's, what's the next phase gonna cost? And is it three phases or four phases? Um, I'm wondering if there's time, if you think there's time, Carol, between now and when we would otherwise meet again, I heard three weeks, um, to get an estimate of that cost from your consultants. And I, for one, uh, somebody suggested this, can't remember, Chris, maybe, um, would support a modest increase in the overall funding uh, to cover that cost, as long as I'm not misunderstanding what Sarah's saying about eligibility. Yeah, and an update to the numbers in the historic structures report would, would definitely be eligible, yeah. El yeah. eligible for CPA funding. I do think that would help and I'm not sure it entirely addresses some of the issues that like Martha and others have raised around kind of long-term stewardship so Sarah I don't know if you have thoughts or suggestions about how we could phrase it um, or, or what we might ask for that would fall that would be fundable from us or at least partially fundable from us that would give us both yeah what are we looking at in the short term but also what is your kind of vision and plan for the long term historic preservation of this property yeah i, I mean having those numbers um may help smith charities to do some additional financial planning uh, that's not done with CPA funds, I'm sure would be a benefit as well. Um, and would also you know, allow them to plan for usage of their own resources. Other committee members? My, uh, my question is it, it, if we were to delay Brian, Brian, could I just offer a piece of information? I'm sorry to interrupt. The, the, the numbers are from last fall. So there's a, a plan that was five years ago, but that chart that has the low, medium, and high, I got those from Dory's architectural form, firm just um, you know a month or so before the, the fall application. So those are current. And, and the, the ask is in the higher column of the low, medium, high, because we anticipate that inflation costs are gonna make it higher. But but if the committees, I, I love the idea of getting the entire five-year-old plan updated. Like there's a lot of interior stuff that could be done on the second floor in particular. The, the ground floor, you should come by. It actually looks nice. Um, but anyway, um, but, uh, but, you know, I would be happy to amend our application and say if, if the amount that was initially spent on um, uh, Dory's architectural firm's assessment, if you, if was it 15,000, Sarah, something like that? Um, if we could ask for that and, and have, have that be, you know, a cap for updating the entire five-year-old plan, that would be wonderful. But the numbers for this particular project um, are from last fall. 
So it's not five years old. I just wanted to add that. Sorry, dude. I just say in this environment, six months doesn't seem like a long time, but um, in the construction industry, it's prices have been going up, you know, significantly yeah. in very much, very short periods of time. Right. That's why we, this proposal is in the high column of the low yeah, medium. I see that. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm more comfortable with voting on the proposal as it exists now, rather than uh, asking Carol or others to come back with an additional component to that. Um, there's no reason why, in my opinion, our vote uh, has to wait for an update of what's going to happen in the future, because it's not going to change what the what I, I can't see it changing the 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 request as it is now and carol could come back to us in the fall with a smaller hopefully much smaller request for for uh some of the stuff that that that, that we're asking for um other discussion about this jeff jones um Thanks, Brian. I'm wondering another thinking out loud if we, I don't want to lose what some of the earlier comments that we had about um, public stewardship and opening the facility out to the public or maybe getting involved in a historical tour um, <clears throat> and that kind of stuff. Is there a way to memorialize that discussion? Um, in a letter from the chair of the CPC to Smith Charities, um, kind of outlining where we're at right now in March of 2023, um, essentially saying were this um, to come back before the committee in the fall or the following spring, um, these are the kinds of concerns that were voiced in March of 2023 that will be back on the table going forward <clears throat> that doesn't have to fit the rigid you know funding um, for CPC money but just to like um, I just don't want to lose that train of thought because I thought that was really rich um, yeah I mean, if the what, committee feels strongly what, about public access and specifying that a, a certain number of public events shall be held within the structure within the within a certain period of time is something that's been done before and could be done here as well as a condition sir yeah um like lathrop communities was one where the the committee had concerns about the general public and not knowing about the public access availability to the trail so they had several public events um mm -hmm. And there were a few historic preservation projects as well. For, for what it's worth, Lori, if you have historic tours, I love talking to tour groups. You can sign me up. Like I'd, I'd love to welcome people in and tell them the story. It's a really neat story. Um, Sarah, what about the other suggestions that Jeff Jones made about composing a letter that would go out uh, summarizing some of these issues that are that don't fit under the neat category of conditions. Um, I mean, the 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 uh, allowing public access in a event or a series of events on a yearly basis uh, seems condition worthy. The other stuff, perhaps a little more convoluted. But is that something that you could work on? And I can certainly help you with that. Trying to and and your, your thoughts on that, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the committee wants to add something to the project file for future committees, you know, one year or 10 years down the road, that's certainly something that, that can be done. Um, you, you just won't have any control over what any future committee decides to do with that information. Uh, other comments from committee members? So what I'm hearing is that we have we could put one condition on, which is increasing public access and how we phrase that, uh, uh, we'll, we'll have to figure out. Um, 
we're asking Sarah and myself to draft a letter to Smith Charities outlining some of these other um, requests uh, that will not tie down future committee members, but also, uh, as Jeff said, Jeff Jones said, memorialize what this conversation has been so we don't forget it or lose lose the thread of this conversation uh and that we that and it seems like we could be headed for a vote soon as in right now um given these issues is that is that correct are we are we getting ready to vote or do we need to discuss things more so thumbs up from folks yeah okay there's a majority of thumbs up so um, it, 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 any further discussion before before we vote? And and Sarah, you would put forth a condition, and we would meet in two weeks to look at those council conditions. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so, is there a motion out there? I'll move that the um, award be made to Smith Charities in the full amount of the request with the conditions that Brian has stated. I'll second, second that. Oh. Thank you, Jen. Sarah? All right, so if there's no further discussion, uh, roll call, Jana? Yeah. Jeff Dawson? Yes. Jen? Yes. Chris? Yes. Jeff Jones? Yes. Bev? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous. All thank right. you all. Thank you all. And I heard you. And and I, I'd love to be contacted if you have ideas for public access. I, I really love community engagement. So Sarah's got my information. Just email me with ideas. Great. Thank you, Carol, for your comments and for helping us uh understand and uh this proposal and see it through so we 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 appreciate your time um so sarah when we come back in two weeks i'm sorry in three weeks uh we'll have condition orders to go through as well as the i'm sorry we'll have the council orders to go through as well as conditions that are set on this um you'll have a couple of other uh um minutes for us to approve at some point we have to have the discussion and perhaps that would be the time about uh, zoo continuing to zoo or to go back to meeting in person for fall rounds as so many other committees throughout the state and country are are doing um uh is there any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published so i i just have to I have to point out that you did the shopping cart only. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to do that during the discussion at the next meeting. Um, no, no, I think we should do that now. So we have a shop. <laughs> uh, as I think uh, Bev said, anything that happens after nine is, uh, is suspect, right? Um, or maybe 8.30. Uh, so we have a shopping cart that's full of uh, fully full funding for all three projects, Historic Northampton Forbes Library and Smith Charities. Um, so I'm gonna make an assumption we can keep the keep all three of those in the same shopping cart and vote on the cart as a whole. Sarah, we're allowed to do that. Is that right? Sure. Uh, up to you know, in the in past rounds, some people have wanted to pull out individual projects. So in, unless anyone wants to do that at this point. Okay. Sorry. Does anyone want to pull out an individual project for reconsideration? All right, we are checking out our full shopping cart of fully funding all three for the uh, to the tune of four hundred twenty nine thousand, something like that, which will leave us <clears throat> a little over two hundred thousand in uh, in the uh, that would be available for uh, for for the fall. So that's a good thing. Plus some uh, money we were not allowed to spend this year, right, Sarah? Which was uh, fifty nine. Correct. 64. There was a, a little bit. I think about twenty thousand that was in excess of the amount that we projected in the original council order. So that will roll over as well. Okay. 
And I thought there was something else that the special funding that, or extra funding that was gonna roll over, no? Yeah, that was the, the surplus state funding. Okay, and that was the 20,000? Yeah, it was, uh, I can look, but it was somewhere around there. Okay, so we're looking at somewhere around uh, 225,000 or maybe a little more than that rolling over, 230,000 rolling over into, into, uh, into fall, into the next fiscal year. Uh, so we're voting on the shopping cart. Is there a motion to move forward the full, fully funding all three of these projects? So moved. Second. Uh, Sarah? All right, and roll call, Jana? Yes. Jeff Dawson? Yes. Jen? Yes. Chris? Yes. Jeff Jones? Yes. Bev? Yes. Martha? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous. Any other business uh, not foreseen when the agenda was published? Martha? I know it's really late, but I just have to say this. Um, I listened again to the tape from the last meeting and I listened to that whole discussion about the fee to the Community Preservation Coalition. And I really think the problem lies with their fee structure because they're doing these tiers. And, you know, so as it is now, Boston is paying like, you know, 0.005% of their overall $39 million budget to give away. And we're paying like, five times that of ours. And so I just would like to make a suggestion and maybe we can put that forward to uh, Stuart that they revisit that. I'm sure it was developed at a time when um, there weren't as many communities, there weren't so many big communities, and I just don't really think it's functioning the way it should. Great suggestion, Martha. Uh, Bev, I don't believe you were at that meeting uh, as well uh, two weeks ago, but one thing that we've asked uh, Sarah to do is to re-invite, not to re-invite, to invite Stuart, uh, who is the director of the statewide coalition, to uh, one of our meetings, hopefully perhaps in the fall, and we could act, we could make that suggestion before, or at least make it make it during that during that meeting uh, as well. But it's a great it's it's a great thought, Martha. Any other business to discuss, Janet? Uh, I already emailed Sarah about this, but just wanted to uh, let the group know I'm not going to be at the next meeting because it's um, I'm going to be at a Passover Seder and would just suggest that in the future, trying to not schedule meetings on the first night of Passover, particularly when if we'd had more applications that might have been used for public comment, um, would be good just to make sure that these meetings really do remain um, accessible to all. I didn't realize that. I apologize. We could certainly shift it to a different date. That's not a problem. It, it seems to me in recognition of a religious holiday, perhaps we should move it. Yeah, and we could meet if it works for everyone, either on uh, two weeks from now on the 29th or uh, a different date in April. We are due to the small number of applications and the speediness of the committee. We're a little bit ahead of schedule this round. So we have some flexibility. Uh, I, the last person to want to keep us, but um, it, it occurred to me, there was a fourth application at the meeting I was at for the, uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, program, but for the NOAA properties. Yeah, they, that, they pulled their application. Okay, all right. So we're not, uh, we did was not- that, it was, was that it in was response to our questions or? They're independent. We don't know. I think it was. Uh, it, uh, I think a bit of maybe a large part of it was in due to the fact that they did not get the large pot of money. Uh, okay. The uh, was it four hundred thousand or something that they were they were yeah. looking for. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, so let's get back to uh, Jana's uh, issue and the issue of not scheduling on religious holidays. Could people meet in two weeks? Which would be, what did you say, Sarah, the 29th? Uh, 26th. Uh, I'm seeing it as a 29th. My, no, I'm a month ahead. I apologize. Yes, 29th. 29th. Would that work? Thumbs up for folks if it would work? 
Okay. Yeah, so let's do that. Switch it off. Thank you, Jan, for bringing that up. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so 29. I also didn't realize until I looked at my calendar like a week ago and was like, oh, wait a minute, that's not going to work. Um, so glad, glad to move it. Thank you. Uh, and um, any other business? Okay, so we will see you in two weeks. Uh, motion to adjourn, second, yes. Okay, all in favor, yeah, okay.